Yep, and I do have, um, I have an AC vent behind me, uh, but, you know, the AC's not always running, especially because I don't want to always have to, you know, have a 24-7 AC power bill. And so I have um, a tower fan off to the side. I cranked it up a little bit to at least just get some more airflow, but I, I don't want that to create a distracting noise into the microphone. All right, well... We have created the, the foundational documents for this region that we're going to be creating. And in fact, I, I think we can even get a, a twofer map in here because we ended up telling a story simply by doing this exercise. And this is going to become the basis, or it, it'll at least become a partial basis for the adventure we're going to send our monsters characters on tomorrow. You know, so we have a desert forest area, a swamp desert area. We have these two city-states that are separated by a river. And there are some notable features. Now, when it comes down to the details about, you know, the corrupt officials as a current calamity, that isn't necessarily going to be represented on the map that we're making. But we are going to be looking for some overarching um, architectural, geological, geographical... Um, you know, theological, things that would be the constructs of, of man or nature. And I want to check also, real quick, like, the documents for the five player characters we generated, the five monsters characters, to make sure that there it doesn't reference a particular location or something along those lines. Uh, let's see... Discovery, every experiment has the potential to reveal more secrets. Uh, so she had a laboratory, but that's more on a micro level, like a district in the town. Um, although, I mean, we could always say that there was a district that was just leveled by an explosion. Uh, sibling, I'm in regular communication with the instructor uh, who set you on the path of research. Uh, so nothing nothing on the grand scale that we're going to be designing for Gobmox, our goblin. Now we have Cabo here, who is our kobold. Uh, long stretches of quiet to clear my mind. Oh, she is a fisher, so, well, we definitely have a river. Uh, balance, do not fish in the same spot twice. And I lost something important in the deep sea, and I intend to find it. Now, now what we, I guess we could interpret the deep sea perhaps in a lake, and we can find a way to work this in. Uh, she's a lobster wrestler. Somewhere is a dragon that uh, she worships, and we're thinking a gold dragon, uh, because uh, the gold dragon bloodline for uh, our for Gobmox's sorcery class. No, that, that's what it is. Now we have Samantha the Domain, who is our arcane trickster rogue orc. Uh, let's see, I face problems head on. I have a crude sense of humor. I always appear like I'm about to kill everyone. Uh, killing enemies. Uh, I owe my survival to a non-orc. I obey the law, even if the law causes misery. I'm slow to anger, but when I do uh, become enraged, I fight until my enemies are dead, no matter the cost. Okay, so nothing really geographical uh, there. Then we have Yano, our Yanti pureblood. Uh, we are, uh, well, we are a wizard. And so there's some sort of a, an academy or a wizard study, presumably. I derive genuine pleasure from the pain of others. Um, uh, okay, so there is uh, there is a guild hall. You know, as we have these guilds, and actually, you know what? Because uh, we, we actually have the five characters that we generated... From 66 different backgrounds, three of the five ended up with a Ravnica background. And so, in this case, you know, where we have a tavern that caters to a specific race or guild, what we could do in this case is simply have it be a specific guild, or simply that someone must belong to a guild to get into the Prancing Demon. No matter which one, but you have to belong to one of the guilds. 
And while we were drawing inspiration from Ravnica, it this is not setting place in Ravnica. And the guild structure could simply be an apolitical economic institution set in the entire region meant to draw on the talents of everyone who lives there. And so the guild, the guilds are, are getting pinched with this rivalry between the city states because it's, it's depriving resources or commerce or opportunity, or it's killing people uh, who could be buying their goods or services or becoming other guild members. And lastly, we have Omnigo Aniles, our female tabaxi monk detective. So we're going to have a monastery of some kind or, or some sort of a, a justice center, a training center. Uh, she's all about that guild. So, yeah, we're, we're going to have to put these guilds uh, in uh, somewhere on the maps as well. Demir agent or the equivalent this new prov is the area where the Azorius guild exists in Ravnica and her obsession's a lost civilization and hence that's what's going to get us over to discover the elves dragonborns and half orcs hey Victor welcome I feel like I want to tell about my homebrew races the the Bethetis cultural and societal structures um, if, if, yeah, if you want to, if you want to talk about that, Victor, you're welcome to, to do so. Tamrick says, maybe we could have a monster match service run by the monster tavern. Uh, what do you mean by that, Tamrick? All right, so we have some ideas. First things first, what I would like to do to create kind of a dynamic looking map. And this could very well be for our own reference. Is I want to... I want to kind of cut the map in half like this. There we go. It's not really half. It's more like one-third, two-thirds. And we're going to put the... Hu well, I say human. There's no humans. I'm going to put the, the normal settlement here, and then we're going to make the map that has the two warring city-states over here. Oh, gotcha. Well, society might have something like that. I mean, the one, the one uh, popular tavern certainly can offer features similar to that. Uh, so what we'll do is... Uh, oh, no, we want that to be a black line. For the monstrous side of things, that is based in a desert that uh, has a swamp and a forest. Now, a desert doesn't always have to be sand. Oh. Come on. There we go. Because remember, a desert is based on a lack of precipitation and not sand and hotness, heat. As uh, as Oldport Media pointed out, there is a region in New Jersey, in New Jersey, on the you know the Garden State, uh, called the Pine Barrens. So instead of going for, instead of going for something that is like this bright yellow that I traditionally use for a sandy desert, why don't we go for this uh, for this kind of wash color? Now, in the in the humanoid side of things, this was Arctic and grassland. And so I think we can represent grassland with some green. Let's scoot this over a bit so my mascots aren't completely aren't completely blocking things. One thing that we know is that a great river divides the two uh, strenuous or strained relationship monstrous cities. And I think what we can do for this, we don't need mountains. Uh, the, the water's coming from somewhere. The mountains are probably far off. 
But these these people establish themselves around a river. And we can have the river come in. Remember, water is lazy. Water always finds the path of least resistance. When you are designing a river like this, you are also drawing topography, whether you knew it or not, or whether you wanted to or not. If you have a shaky hand, drawing rivers is actually your friend. And we'll make this, you know, a greater river. Now, of course, we can put all kinds of creeks, cricks, tributaries. and more here. And you'll see where I'm gonna go with some of this stuff very shortly. I hope I turned the background music on. I, I did, okay, you know what? We had this playing in the background. We're talking about a desert. Let's let's play some desert winds to kind of get in the mood here. Maybe we could have a monster. Okay, so there's a a rock desert. Uh, it could be very rocky, more like a what we might consider to be a wasteland. Um, you know, just uh, it, it's difficult to farm because there are a lot of rocks uh, in the soil. Come down here. Woo, woo, woo. Lots of little wiggles and squiggles. So it doesn't get precipitation, but there's a, a very good, a very powerful river that runs through this place. And I think it was Old Port that made the analogy of the Nile. Yeah, the Nile absolutely supports life, even though everyone lives in the desert, because it is fresh water. And there's plenty of it to help crops grow and to help people. Uh, for drinking and cooking and waste uh, removal. All right, so one step at a time. Again, I, I don't want... I, I really, really do hope that whenever I do maps, especially in MS Paint, you all feel absolutely confident that if I can do it in MS Paint, so can you. Because you definitely can. And you can create some very good maps that are going to get the point across to your players without needing to agonize over, you know, expensive software or Photoshop or anything. Uh, there's nothing wrong with, with uh, Photoshop or the like, but if you have MS Paint, I want to keep this accessible. It does have a massive flooding problem, that is true. And so there would be some kind of a, a floodplain. You know, we, we don't call it really grassland, but we can very much put that there is some, some farming area uh, when there are floods that come through, if there are floods. This doesn't have to be, you know, this doesn't have to be the mighty Mississippi River, or it doesn't have to be the Nile. Uh, this could just be, a, for some reason, just a, a near steady stream of water. It's whatever we want it to be, and we can consider all kinds of options here. Um, Hark says, I just thought of a salt sand desert. You wouldn't like to accidentally open your mouth in a salt sandstorm. I would agree, Hark. Now we have this fisher who is who lost something in the deep sea. What would be a sea in a desert area? 
And that could very well be a place where we have more like a, a, a great lake. You know, maybe something, if we want to talk about something the size of uh, uh, one of the Great Lakes, uh, well, Lake Erie is very close. I mean, I could I could almost go out my door and, and see Lake Erie. Um, but it, it might not have to even be that grand. But on some scale, we actually have an area of deeper water. And we can even indicate that if we come up this way. Like so. And let's put the accompanying band. Now, mind you, also, I'm not using special tools. I have a traditional mouse on a horizontal mouse pad. And what we'll do to indicate that this is deeper water is we'll we'll make it bluer. In fact, if we really want to, we can we can get super deep and we can say like here's the basin, right? Here's here's the deep part of the lake. So it's not just, you know, 10 15 feet deep like the river could get or even, you know, 30 feet deep like the rest of the lake. Here we have a basin that for some, you know, th this is the deepest part. We're getting maybe 50 feet down. That's the deep sea to people who live in a desert and have never seen salt water before. And of course, I mean, you, you could go through and we can, we can make, uh, you know, topographical lines and you know, we could go, we can go nuts on that if we really want to. I'm not worried about that right now, but here at least we have the river and the shallows coming through. <clears throat> now. As we have water that is traveling, ultimately it's all traveling downhill to get to the sea. In order to have a swamp, we need a low-lying area. It could be further upriver because then it just spills over this own little basin and, and continues down. But we can very easily uh, make a swamp. You know, maybe in this case, the swamp city is further downstream. And we put the forest up here next to the lake. And this is this is indicating then that we have, or we could even say that we have a swampy part of the lake. So this basin might actually extend further out. And, and so it's not so much lake though as it gets into stagnant water uh, out this away before draining out, and we could even put like another tributary or something coming down here. Um, but the water here tends to be more stagnant, and it does share some of the life of the forest, and now we have this lake or this river separating the two city-states and these warring factions. Now if we do this, Usually something like a lavender you can use to indicate a swamp. And this swamp can very much, in fact, we, uh, let's see if this is, we have this deep basin. So things are going to be slower instead of a river that's, that's going to be coursing more quickly, maybe around the edges. Um, and so this water is kind of like slowly going here and draining through. If we are indicating that generally our water is going in this direction, and ultimately this is downhill to the sea. Water's pouring in. So it'd be more stagnant, especially if... If it hit something, kind of, kind of came back this way and just got stuck in a in a bit of a swirl, perhaps.
and we'll extend out. So in this case, I mean, so the river is kind of being replaced, but we can extend the the depth going a little bit out like this. Then we have our our deeper water, or are not as deep waters. We'll actually bring it in so that this is indicating that there's a quick drop off. And now this is very shallow. Not that this can't be swamp either. Um, I mean, if we really want to just draw, you know, swamp or we can come back with lavender. And we can indicate depth, but we can just simply go like this. Showing that this is more of a stagnant area. Whatever you'd like to do. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk this back a little bit. Oh, that's as far as I could go there. That's fine. Uh, sorry, I missed some chat here. The Sunken Sea, the Salsa Sea, <laughs> the, the Dune Sea. Uh, could the forest continue toward and through the swamp? Yeah, yeah, we can have kind of a yin-yang thing going on. Wedge one city over the northeast side of the Lake or River in a V formation. In a V formation? Like, like that? Maybe the Monster City folk are frightened of the wild things in the swamp. Underground river makes it to the surface. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is and so what that what that could even indicate then if we did that. By the way, if we come back through and we're kind of woo, we do this, and then of course we fill this in because we are professionals with uh, MS Paint here, and we're we're showing. So here's still that deep core. What we can show, if we come back through. is there's actually this might be detached from the river proper and the lake because you know an, o an oasis is kind of like a swamp it's fed by an underground spring but somewhere back up this way or th through here is a cave system where water is is coming up and it's burbling up in this area but it's not really going anywhere it's not really getting flushed out it might be evaporating and so it's creating this swamp which could, in its own right, you know, create uh, maybe a, a a farmland area. You know, we could indicate that with orange stripes or something. Um, but yeah, that's not a bad idea either. Uh, the Brontosauri live in the deep swamp. Wasn't the Brontosaurus proven to be a false dinosaur, or was I mistaken for something else? Sorry, just a random thought. Uh, Old Port said, "I'd totally be." the person who would put the team through that underground river. Oh. Uh, you too, huh? Land of the Lost back in here. Interior of the V is the lake sorta idea. Possible interest point if the underground river sources from the basin goes down river, you could theoretically try to block it. Doing so would wipe out whatever was in, oh, was down the pathway. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you're messing with people's water sources... Um, that's, you know, we're talking about, uh, a city under siege. Uh, it could also be like that, where you're blocking their water or access to it. And we can say that perhaps there is this forest area that exists around the lake 
probably hugging part of the river. Maybe not out too far if there's not a lot of precipitation. Or there might be patches. But it's kind of grown in here. And the forest had submerged to become this swamp. And once more, if you want to indicate that there's uh, a lot of crossover, you can just go like this on your map to show that, you know, through whatever distance, there is this kind of transition zone between the two. Everything doesn't have to be just clean lines. Uh, you can make it whatever you want to, uh, whatever you want it to be. Let's extend the forest out a little bit more. We have a pretty big swamp, and we want to create this kind of we want to create this kind of yin yang between the two nation states and use the real estate that we have. But we'll have it come back up this way and hug kind of close. Whoops! Oh, I missed something somewhere. Let's patch up the ends and give it another try. There we are. Uh, it's possible, Tamric. Um, you know, I th th so that would come down to things like, uh, you know, whatever random encounters, racial kind, uh, racial uh, demographics, uh, things along those lines. I'm not against that, but the map isn't really going to be detailing that kind of a thing. Yeah, that's very clever and and very uh, very effective at what it would do, Old Port. Um, waste removal is something that is a it's a serious concern, and what many cities uh, that would have that would have flourished otherwise has suffered from it. This might be fed by like a, a tributary, like something kind of small, a couple little ones streaming down. This would pour out. Maybe it starts out kind of like a, a large shallow area, but then it gets down and turns into more of a, like a, a delta where we have just a lot of a lot of little tributaries which in a sense this would be a swamp itself if perhaps there weren't a lot of uh, a lot of you know raised islands of land or strips of land And so we're showing here that there's uh, that this is an, uh, the topography of the area is indicative of a lot of like it's broken land. It could be very cracked and very dry. So the water is still flowing through the swamp, but it's it's having to snake its way through all these gaps and pits. And if perhaps at some point in time, this southeastern side of things was was a forest. Maybe the forest has been retreating. All the roots had dried up, but they dug these these holes. Or it's also indicating that if there are if there is a bunch of cracks in the ground, that this is why we have a swamp because there's finally enough water here 
that it has filled in the, the cracks. It's kind of probably liquefied them back down to clay or a very loose soil, but the water just keeps welling up and kind of, you know, flowing around. Um, and it eventually drains out after a couple tributaries also come in. In fact, we can even kind of snake one down this way. Again, this may be a desert, but it doesn't mean there's not water. And we're getting... Uh, so really, the desert's getting severe when you get past, you know, this point because something happened, right, that wiped out whatever was holding the ground together or keeping things temperate. And so now we just have this little bit that's left that's clinging onto this uh, this oasis. And it's a shame that we have these, uh, you know, these, these monster folk. And there might be more that live up or down river. Nothing wrong with, uh, nothing wrong with indicating under otherwise. Uh, but here they're trying to get along, and someone, as Orc was, uh, as uh, Easy Orc was saying, you know, there, there could be a red herring, or there could be a plot afoot, or whoever can control the lake or the oasis, whoever can control the deep, controls the area, right? We have charlatans who have uh, who have uh, secreted themselves into the faith of the forest society. And then we have these corrupt politicians who are, you know, ruining this this swamp-like area. And the city could be could exist on stilts in the swamp. We could even put the city like in the desert but on the edge of the swamp. And not every, you know, not this all doesn't have to be some fetid, stinky sewer swamp. Swamps can be beautiful. Have you seen Magic the Gathering art? Swamps can absolutely be beautiful. It's it, Just as a desert is a matter of precipitation, a swamp is more about the stagnation of the water or how quickly it, it flows, if at all. That's a broad definition for any of you geologists out there or uh, people, you know, environmentalists. Uh, don't rake me over the coals, please. But there's nothing saying that we can't have a dry, more arid city that sits on a swamp where they do draw their water. In fact, a swamp has a great filter effect. Think of all the cattails and swamp grasses and wetlands that exist here that filter this water. In fact, you know, as we're going through the plot that Oldport was saying, you know, if uh, there could be a lot of sewage. In fact, inadvertently, maybe this other city has been dumping their sewage or something's been happening, but it's actually been filtered on its way through to the city that's, you know, out here. Uh, sorry, I'm falling behind in chat here. Uh, Tamarick, thank you for the compliment. Old Port, uh, like having people block that and then backing it up with sewage being downstream from your city, then break it with a bomb will poison everything on the downside as the living mass smears itself down the interior of the river. But that's me setting up hor uh, a horrible everyone dies plot. Uh, good, nice disguise, Kafka. Uh, maybe we could have pygmies in the swamp. Uh, London, for example, Old Port says. Uh, yeah, London, filthy city back in the days, considering it had that 200-ton uh, fat or pooberg discovered last year. Yeah, oh yeah, they're, they're finding all sorts of these uh, blockages by uh, people who are just pouring, uh, you know, restaurants pouring their fat into the drains, um, or people flushing things that shouldn't be flushed, um, you know, like paper towels or, you know, like uh, feminine products, things like that. Uh, and then, of course, you know, then it binds with the, the cooling grease and it forms these, uh, it, it just forms this blockage, um, you know, that uh, it, it gives the city sewer system kind of a, a heart attack there. In fact, they found a cement one in London not that long ago. For some reason, someone poured a lot of cement down a drain and it all just congealed. Uh, back then, we had to wade hip high through the sewage just to get to school and when we got there, the headmistress whipped us good. Tamarick is, remember is remembering the good old days. Hey, Kitty Bird, welcome back. So we can even have the cities occupy areas that aren't necessarily in the biome 
but are close enough to it that they can that they can extract and harvest and they still have to trade uh, going through around or under in this case. Uh, let's see. In our first one, it's a matriarchy or monarchy. There are giant statues carved out of, a, out of a mountainside or cliff. In this case, and, and we want to talk about things uh, things going downriver. Um, so we could have something just sort of like a butte or a plateau. If we did something like that, just, you know, like a like Devil's Rock in Australia or something. Water's coming down this way. Meaning that the mountains are to the northeast. If we're in a desert, the mountains are blocking the clouds. Um, or if they're not blocking, they're otherwise forcing the clouds up and then to cool down enough that the water forms on the back end. And we'd actually get a wet mountain going the other way. Uh, so if that's the case, there might be, like, not, not um, a weather-catching mountain, uh, but we might have something like a foothill or a cliff that kind of carves in this way. And so this other city was built as a protection measure Maybe even partially into, maybe even partially into this, this cliff that exists. Hey, Mr. Wolfie, welcome. Uh, your pull list, uh, Mr. Wolfie, should have been amended so that those two figures are up for trade. And then we have these giant statues. And of course, we ask ourselves, what are the giant statues carved out of? Do they even look like us? You know, the, the Hobgoblins or the Kenku. And there's also this Haunted Hill or a Barrow Mound. Now, we have... So we have the statues. This could be... Even in part, the statues could have been ancient founders. Uh, they, they could be like the... Um, uh, those Peruvian... Those Peruvian figures that were... Uh, that were placed in the desert. Um, these could be kind of like the... Is it the Pueblo Indians? who carve their homes into hillsides. Although in this case, it would, uh, you know, the, the burial mound would simply be this statue adorned hill. And we can indicate something like that with a little, a little indicator. Question is, is being in the mountain or next to it a problem with the rocks and general corrosion? Uh, as this is a primarily a desert, I mean, there might be wind erosion, but I don't think you'd have to worry about mudslides or anything like that, Mr. Wolfie. Anasazi? I don't know if that's the, if that's the tribe. I'm trying to think of the Western tribes, like Hopi, uh, and the like, who, uh, or the Pueblo Indians, uh, who I believe were, were building into a lot of the, the mountains out towards the Rockies. And if I'm remembering my history incorrectly, then please let me know. This might also make sense. We have Kenku that are kind of like crows. Uh, and so what if the Kenku in this city kind of, maybe even the, that, that's kind of built in there. Uh, the Kenku are the ones who are kind of the guardians. You know, they live in this place. Um, and, uh, oh, so in that case, you know what, you know what I think I, uh, we could do? So this place could maybe be considered to be haunted. Maybe this isn't the haunted mound, but this is where the Kenku primarily live. It's big. Uh, maybe it was a burial uh, site at some point in time, but you have these crows who are making their nests in the burial area. And we come back and we add a couple other little, um, you know, to show maybe some erosion, but where the water is closer and where the trees are growing up out of it. And so we have this, not really a mountain, but then we can even put little... You know, kind of like little little residual foothills kind of coming out this way. And maybe here, 
we get into some rapids or something as the, the river is squeezed between here and then there's a rock. Maybe that the water's even busted through. And so this gets wild and wacky here. Ancient Native American tribe uh, out here in the southwest. Well, yeah, if, if you... Uh, or wait, isn't uh, Anasazi, isn't that the symbol of the person kind of curled on himself playing a flute? Isn't that kind of a, a general, uh, like a, a Native American, is it a trickster god? Isn't that the name for that? There's a temple to a false deity that's run by charlatan priests. Now, that's more of a detail if we're to make a city map. But that's something to, ke to keep in mind when we're making our adventure tomorrow. And, of course, the tavern of the Prancing Demon. Oh, uh, so Cocopelli. Cocopelli is, that, uh, is the, the southwest, that, uh, that tribal symbol. Because it's the person with like the, the long hair, like almost looks like dreadlocks or something coming back, kind of like dancing, curled on itself, and it's playing a, a pipe or a flute of some kind. So now here we have a confederacy of, the, of primarily here we have tabaxi and hobgoblins. And so the, the cats are living in the, in the, the swamp. You know, and it, there's nothing saying also that tabaxi aren't, you know, living in the forest and they cross the swamp, maybe tree to tree. There could be this raised highway system. And also not that the tabaxi aren't welcome here, uh, but there's definitely tension. And, you know, we have goblins. We have this the hobgoblins of the southeast, and we have the the bugbears of the northwest. And in between, you know, living in the lake area, uh, living around here, there could very well just be goblins, the small kind, who are eking out a living uh, as they can in the forest or, you know, off the river, or they're, they're eating grubs in the swamps or worms. We have a ruined or toppled statue of a person or deity and an intact statue. Um, and so those statues could uh, be a part of the city or almost if you think, uh, what are the two, the, those two great statues in Lord of the Rings? You know, the, the, the prior kings that have their hands held out like this. Um, that could even be uh, held out as a, as a sign uh, that you're entering the swamp or you're entering this land. And, uh, and to do so, we can even, uh, again, this is our map. Our, our players haven't seen this yet. What if we say that the river also splits, like a, a big split, comes down this way? And so you can uh, easily take a freshwater boat, kind of come across, and now now you're getting into an area that maybe has been kind of curated because you can you can put fresh wa fresh water channels through the swamp if you'd like, and we can say that there's sort of a main path. That's been cleared through the swamp that we can indicate with uh, with this color blue, or we can indicate it that uh, a channel, kind of a canal, has been carved through the swamp. And we'll do it with this kind of like dusty uh, gray blue. Kind of comes around, goes like this. And then you finally reach the end of the swamp after going on your freshwater excursion through the forest. And so this is almost a highway or a path. And these statues could exist here to, to act as guides, uh, as guides. And maybe one closer was toppled, and the other one indicating you're getting even closer is the one that's still intact, or vice versa. Uh, there's an ancient tree containing a trapped spirit. So now we have uh, a ruined or toppled statue and an intact statue. Nothing is saying that these have to be made of stone. These could be made of wood. These could be carved. Um, and what if we have another tree? I mean, they can be. I'm throwing out ideas here. The tree could be a great... Uh, it could be a great, like a redwood. Even bigger. I, I don't know if we're going like Yggdrasil or something like that. But it growing out of the middle of the swamp could be this big tree that towers even over the trees here 
in the trees that, and by the way, if you want to indicate things, like trees are kind of growing uphill in the nooks and crannies of the foothill, you could just, you can go like that. But maybe here in the middle, we'll make it we'll make a little raised area in the swamp. And by the way, a swamp would have a lot more raised areas than this, than just this. All of this is not a giant puddle. There's mud banks and sandbars and all kinds of stuff going through here. It, you know, if I was really dedicated, I'd take this kind of uh, this kind of blue and I just crisscross it everywhere, and then I'd fill in the gaps with either vi uh, this violet or with this sand color. But maybe in the middle is kind of this sandbar, and we have this great big old tree that even on the map, so great is it, you can you can see the canopy. And then we have some grass growing, and it's like the, a, little, a little haven. And there's a, a spirit, maybe a protective spirit of some kind that's here. And so we have a living spirit, and then of course we have this barrow mound that's out somewhere else that has dead spirits inside of it. That's the one, Tamric. Thank you for, uh, thank you for reminding me of that. I, I've forgotten about that symbol. I know for a while in pop culture, that symbol, like you could find that in a lot of places. Um, you know, it was very popular, uh, even outside the Southwest. And I, I think a lot of that has sort of kind of faded with a, a cultural, you know, the, the cultural fad it was. To us who aren't uh, in that culture, I should say. So a river divides the city. There's a great hero or a savior. Um, corrupt officials. We can't really say the corrupt. Hey, Derek, welcome. I, I hope that, uh, speaking of London, uh, <laughs> so Derek, in that vampire game, have they addressed the giant uh, fatbergs, poobergs, or cementbergs that have been clogging up the, the sewers of London? Just drop in and say hi and check in before I crash. Well, thank you for doing so, Derek. Hey, by the way, Derek, you can welcome Tamarick to the club Tamarick just opened his first box of minis on stream. And so here we go. Like, we have a basic map. We can always add to this, but this takes the core elements. And as we're playing with the imagery, we have the words. Now let's paint, pardon, let's paint the words. Let's, let's develop it. We can always go back and change things and still keep the spirit of the words, but the words don't tell us exactly where something is. You know, it doesn't indicate that something has to be inside or outside the settlement uh, or the region. The haunted, the haunted Barrow Mound? What if that's at this kind of crossroads of the rivers down here? Yes, it's closer to, it's closer to swamp territory than forest society. Though in many cultures... Having a crossroads like this is a very spiritual place. And if we're also going to be exploring this, this immigration, this discovery of new people, what if these new people either crossed by land over this desert or they came up the only the liquid channel keeping them alive? And so here, if this is the burial mound, it was here that perhaps they had their first settlement because they had fresh water. Now, they were downriver in this case. But they knew what was behind them, and they could see anyone who was coming downriver. And so the old burial mound could be an old fort that got flooded and covered in sediment over the years as everything built up here and fossilized or whatever. Um, and, and this is going to be a lot like the one we're going to put over in our Arctic grasslands. But think about this. Think about all the things that you've generated and how you can play with the idea directly, indirectly, you know, take a step to the side, use it as inspiration, uh, compare it to other folklore or stories you've heard. But now that we have our, you know, the primary foundation of our map, for our monstrous area without making the city maps and, and we could go through and do that I want to, to make I, I keep wanting to call it the human there's no humans here you know you could even say that the, the half orcs are they're a, a culmination of some orcish blood that fell into elf blood or even dragonborn blood you know if these are the major races not that there can't be humans here because maybe this is an outpost 
Uh, may maybe this city is the last city on the edge of the known PHB race lands. And, it, you know, it was so long ago that, yes, they sent people upstream, but they never came back, and only horror stories. Uh, or, or people came back, but they were haunted or carried diseases. And that's how you have this kind of sister or brother burial mound. And so no one ever wanted to push past this frontier. Until now. So grassland and Arctic are going to be our, our themes. And I'm so I have grassland and, you know, Arctic, we can either just fill in blobs of white. I could take the spray paint tool. Uh, but first things first, you know, we're, we're going to work on this. And if we want to say that the river continues to flow, well, every civilization needs water. Again, for health and cooking and just to consume and also to help carry away the waste. And so we have this society that was built up here on the frontier. You know, we have this kind of mishmash of different races. Uh, this could almost be, you know, not located on another continent like Australia, but this could be where uh, the elements of a primary society are sent to get them out of the way. You know, but they're all out here together. They're all living on the frontier. This is who we are. This is all we have left. And so that's why they're so patriotic. Now, if there's a famine going on, I'll show you what we can do. We have the river, one of these branches, or maybe something else. But, you know, meanwhile, elsewhere... We have our river kind of coming down, and it just stops. There's, you know, there's a couple little tributaries and things that are kind of weaving their way through the grasslands, you know, when things melt. But this turns into a dry riverbed. And we're going to continue to, to draw here. As it as the dry riverbed now is what is weaving through the grasslands. And if we have a famine while we have grassland, we can probably show that the area of the grass is starting to is starting to turn. And we can use something like orange for that. And so we're going to just kind of create a, uh, you know, so maybe it starts here. But, you know, there's still some water kind of percolating through the soil and everything. But starting about here. And spreading and we can even show on this map that it's kind of spreading out because this is only going to be able to give water uh, you know for, for so long Oop, and that one goes right off the map now we're into these famine lands down here The linear boundary is showing these are our two monstrous societies, and this is the place to where the, the monster party is going to seek help and to discover a new society of people not like their own. Now, there's a great stone wall that is lying in ruins. That stone wall could be what was protecting the city. However, it's shattered. 
something has happened. This could even be the product, if we don't want to say earthworms or, or some other kind of worm, maybe there was an earthquake, you know, uh, a plate shifted or, you know, finally enough permafrost because we're talking out of an Arctic area, uh, enough frost just like cracked the land. You know, ground types are weak to ice attacks for a reason. <laughs> and so we can come through and build... Uh, Maybe something like this, and we'll take it gray. And so this city was built on rock and roll. <laughs> if famine's striking, maybe more down here. And then, of course, they can kind of capitalize on the islands that aren't really islands anymore. But we could indicate that here's here's the wall or here's the city boundary. Um, or actually, if we do that and then we come through with this and we make another one. There we go. Then we do this. And then we can take this darker gray and we can put little cracks or tunnels or we can turn things orange to indicate you know oh this is uh the the walls are falling apart and you know what earthquakes can very much alter the course of streams in fact this stream either dried up because not enough water is reaching it from its source or it's falling down into an underground source and the water is now underground but these people might not know that or recognize it. And with this weakling manipulated by other forces, uh, their ruler's adultish lout, things aren't really being done. No one's exploring because there's th this society was so used uh, to the river and, and all the th with uh, this Arctic climate. You know, with it being so cold, and maybe they have either permafrost or, you know, they're used to, yeah, in the spring, uh, the waters will return because they're going to melt into the lands. And sure, but if you're not getting all of the meltwater also from everywhere else and downstream, it might saturate the ground for a little bit. But then as the days get longer and it gets hotter, all the groundwater is going to get sucked up if the groundwater isn't already getting sucked up someplace else. Or draining into something else. And we could, you know, th this is a plot point. What if, you know, you gave them a map and you sort of had them find what's the epicenter? Where's all the water going? And that could lead to this underground river adventure. To lead to a, a magnificent, you know, almost like, a, in this case, you know, uh, it would put a, it would be a lake that would put this one to shame. But this, you know, nearly Great Lake-sized area just underneath all of this now blighted land. If only there was a way to get the water back up to the surface. Aha! Invention, cooperation, working together. You know, this foreign culture visiting, um, where, where they, they control water all the time because they, uh, they have a lot more water coming through. And by the way, we haven't indicated things like roads, highways... Uh, passing through but we're getting a good idea and we're building a story not just for the lay of the land but what happened the the land provides more than just more than just clay and rock and crops it tells a story that's how we can look back in time through a fossil record to understand you know there was a there was a die off at this point because you, you can see a change in the rock. At some point in time, we went from sandstone to sedimentary rock. So something flooded over and kept petrifying to add. Uh, so on this like uh, on this uh, sandy dirt layer, so all of a sudden we now have this sedimentary, which is more like, you know, mud. But there's biological elements in it as well. And it's not just uh, compressed sand and the like.
and we're, we're learning and finding out so much here. And exercises like this where we take what we had already, you know, this was already inspiring enough. This is, this is going to be a foundational document for the story we're going to create tomorrow. But now when we take these ideas and we start laying them out, even in MS Paint, who are these people and what happens? We had this wall around a city. And, you know, this was once a great, you know, sort of a border city, a fortress on the wilderness into the unknown where the monsters are. Ooh, scary. And now it's it's in in uh, it's going to die. There's a threat of that happening. And by the way, I have to put a, a barrow, right? There's this burial mound. And if this if this was an, a precursor of the society, right, that moved from here out to establish where even their ancestors became the monsters, somewhere on the river is another such mound. If this marked their if this marked their arrival and their their attempt at colonization. What marked their departure? So we, if we have the, this old city, you know, they're probably in the islands and doing this, this. This could be an extension of the city with the walls being the river, but it's all now dried up. Maybe the uh, what they considered to be the, the mouth of the river um, is the departure point. And if we want to look, we have a poetic license. And it just so happens that the burial mound you know, when, when these monstrous characters come out and they look all around and they say, oh, wow, look at the, all of this grass growing. Like, we have something like that where we're from, but look how vast and plentiful it is. And then they walk a couple days and they reach here and suddenly all the grass just turns brown and crisps and evaporates in the wind. I mean, it crumbles and dusts, but... And then they, they, they continue saying, well, I guess we should follow the river. You know, because while, while we have a hard cutoff here, you know, you could argue maybe there's like mud and puddles or there's a deep area uh, here. Like it, we'll make a, a particularly deep area. Uh, so the water's not really flowing, but some stuff did manage right here where the, uh, where the river widened out. So there's a little bit of water here. But following the river is a good navigational tool. And, uh, and you know, so they, they may see that uh, the water... You know, there's no water, but a lot of grass, but they see evidence that the water flowed this way. Well, if we're flowing down river, then there's, there's going to be a society, right? And so they'll follow this and follow this. They'll find some water and then they'll find themselves at this, at this foreign city and the story advances. And now we've built a geological timeline, a cultural timeline. We understand as dungeon masters, what is happening in the world that we want to run. And when we know that, that empowers us to make a lot of decisions. If any of you were around for the Tuesday role-playing game, a lot of lore bombs were dropped on the party that tie everything together that has been kind of drip-fed so far. And the party has a timeline of events in the in the world in which they live. And that's powerful. It could be frightening. It could, it could be it could be empowering. Now that you have this knowledge and you can put pieces together, you see the strata of the rocks and you can place events in time. And their significance because of uh, of a burgeoning of life, or a or a, a kill off. You're fading quickly. Talk to you later. Have a great night. Yep. Well, Tamric, we're about done with the workshop, so I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you uh, getting your first box of minis. I I am honored that I earned your business and that uh, we had so much fun with it. So congrats on that. Uh, and I will let you know about the figures. I saw your message that you sent on Discord. And I'll let you know about that, Tamric. And now, just by drawing in MS Paint, I am not an artist. I don't know. Derek or some other artists, or at least people I call artists, might say everyone's an artist. But uh, I, I don't know what the, the, the vague term or the nuanced term of it would be. Anyway, I'm a simple guy who draws squiggles and colors them. Um... And look at everything we've just unlocked about this culture that we generated off of some random dice. That were generated off of characters that we also generated off of random prompts. And now we have a functional world with a, a history and culture and transportation and religion and, and conflict. 
And even if you didn't think of, you know, if you couldn't have thought of all this just from from whole cloth, you know, or from nothing. Look at what you can do if you just crack open a couple of these books and roll some dice. And believe in yourself to tell the story one phrase at a time. Color one blob at a time. Draw one squiggle at a time. And say, all right, this exists. So if this exists, where, why, or how do these other things exist? I know that there has to be a cliff with faces or with statues carved into it. How is that going to work? Oh, well, here. And, and, we've, and we've invented parts of this culture. All right. Well, Tamarick, hey, if you got a, if you got to uh, skedaddle, go ahead. Uh, Cryofrost is saying a green ghost with a brown nightcap in a potato sack. I I see what you're talking about. So here's two eyes, the mouth, uh, wearing the the wearing this, and so someone opened up, uh, someone opened up uh, a potato sack here, and this this green ghost came out. Either that or it's kind of a weird profile of someone with really foppish hair opening their mouth and letting out just this, you know, belch of the damned. And and their eye is open and kind of weeping because of uh, how potent that burp is. Yeah, I, I see it too. So good eye on that cryofrost. And remember, if this is Arctic and you want to indicate things like uh, like permafrost or whatever, you can always come back here and again, just... Oop, draw some squiggles. It exists because it exists. It doesn't need another reason. Because what are your what are your players gonna tell you otherwise? No. That's not how that works. This is this is your world. Of course it works like that. Draw with confidence. What are you gonna do? You're gonna fail to draw a river? It's a blue squiggle. <laughs> That's all you gotta do. And it's your squiggle, and it's your world. The mouth is an entrance to an undead land. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I like the creativity. And you know what? Uh, Cryofrost, you brought up a very good point. If you're ever stuck, even on a map, because look, what do we say Italy looks like? What do we say Spain looks like? You know, what do we call that upper part of Florida? What do we name geological features after? What was the monument that used to exist in New Hampshire before it, it didn't? And you can take a picture that you like and lay it down and just start coloring over it. And calling parts of the picture a forest a swamp, an island, some rivers, you know, you, you just draw through it. This could have been the Ghostbusters logo. We have a blue streak going through. The map could have been round or it's implied. And here's our ghost. Why not? Heck, maybe, maybe a player could catch a similarity. And if they do, just give them a, just give them a wink and a nod. And, and don't tell anyone. And have fun with it. And if they don't, you just came up with a compelling map that everyone loves, and no one knows the true secret origin to. Hopefully it's nothing beyond PG-13 if they ever do find out. <laughs> They're going to wonder about your placement of uh, certain elements. Arguing if I should pick up Yon T because even with an abomination, it's going to be low CR for my current game. Not sure what I should center the next chapter of my Saturday game. 10 to 15 level, need a good bulk monster. Like a, a singular large bruiser or just like some bulky monsters that are going to be a CR 10 to 15. I have one where the mountain range looks like it cuts off the capital to the continent. And it's referred to as the guillotine. I love it. There you go, Derek. Great example. We name things after other things that we have named after other things. Because as human beings, we create mnemonic devices like that. 
You know, uh, think think of this. The next time you pass by a housing subdivision and it has an awesome name like uh like Oak Oaken Acres. And you drive by and there is three trees in the development and probably none of them are oaks. Why did the developer call that that housing that that kind of residential development Oaken Acres? Why did you drive past uh, a neighborhood called The Meadows when there's a city park two blocks away outside of the, the residential area? Why is it called The Meadows? How could you have a place in the middle of Ohio? Now, if we're talking Southeast Ohio, I get it. But you have a place in the middle of Ohio called Mountain View. Why? <laughs> I, I'm not putting any of you on blast. I, I, it's rhetorical. Think about it. Think about the city in which you live and where you see this stuff. You know, you maybe you go past a retirement home and it's called... Uh, it's called Twilight Harbor. Sounds beautiful, doesn't it? Twilight Harbor is in... Uh, I'm, I'm making this up, but... Twilight Harbor is in the middle of Iowa. There's no harbor in Iowa. Not that I'm aware of. And yet you can go and retire with confidence at Twilight Harbor. What... This was brought up earlier. Why is Iceland called Iceland and Greenland called Greenland? Uh, so Derek says, looking for 3 or $4 minis I can pick up on t uh, bulk to be the basis of the conflicts. Yon T might work, but abominations are basically the price of a whole box. And the Malazans are more than a single pull. The great debate. Lake of the Woods. And, and is it not even built in a wooded area or has a lake? You know, and we do this because we want to invoke imagery. You know, do you want your... Do you want to... Do you want to uh, send your grandparents to a nursing home called Twilight Harbor? Or do you want to send them to Podunk County Public retirement home the exact same building the exact same staff everything is the same but one is one is named twilight harbor and the other one is called you know podunk county public retirement home do you want to live in a residential area named the meadows or do you want to live in a in an area called uh, residential zone B four? It is a lake in what was once Woodlands, my old hometown. Yeah, and you want to retire in Death Valley? Hey, you got that nice uh, dry, warm air. Help out the old rheumatoid arthritis. Help suppress the asthma. You make your own vitamin D. And there's that one... Derek, if you haven't seen it, there's like that one day of the year that it actually rains in Death Valley. And the next couple days after, the entire valley is flooded with flowers. Because all the seeds have laid dormant for an entire year or, or maybe even more. And if any of you haven't seen it, and of course, why do we call something Death Valley? If you haven't seen it, I forget the, I forget the name of the flower, but I think this year it was a, an impressive bloom. But just look up something like Death Valley flowers. Yeah, cause, because all of the, all the flowers just lie dormant in the heat until that one day or like the one week of the rainy season where you get a week of, of water. 
the entire valley explodes with life. You also get that in uh, in Africa, where you get the rainy season, and uh, there's certain fish, or it's kind of like a mud puppy, where it's a fish that can survive on on by breathing air and by breathing water. And so they lay their eggs in riverbeds. And yeah, the riverbeds dry up, but there's still kind of a, a mud beneath the baked surface. And so once the waters return, all of these fish and other like bugs and everything that have laid their eggs in this protective stasis, they just come out of the water. They grow up quickly. They feast. They travel. These, these, these mud skippers or whatever, they're, I, I think that's another name for them. Um, Barboach, if you play Pokemon, uh, they they just like flop around and they travel from river to river and they they furiously they, they find a mate and they lay that next clutch of eggs as soon as possible before the waters dry up and animals eat their corpses. But as that happens, as they're there kind of suffocating, baking in the heat, and uh, a jackal or a hyena comes up to finish them, you can at least die knowing as as that animal's mouth is crunching around your half baked uh, head that you spawn the next generation that's hidden in the mud of the riverbank to come out next year when it rains. So, all right. Um, so, Derek, uh, if you have to go to bed, I will, I'll rack my brain for things that you can have that might be yawn tea related or some kind of a solution to that problem. Um, but I'm going to get up and take another break. And uh, we finished our settlement. Uh, oh, it's been a magnificent workshop. I've loved it. You all are so creative and wonderful and chatty. Um, so when I come back, we'll have a, a general... Uh, oh, you're going through it now? Okay, well... Uh, I mean, if you find something, obviously let me know, Derek. Uh, but have an awesome night. So when I come back, you know, we'll have a general talk. If any of you want to buy boxes... Look, stream boss is up for dibs. There's only eight hit points left on Shukan. Uh, we can pop minis, or otherwise, uh, speaking of things like deserts and fire, I have to get the fire seed in Secret of Mana, and we'll see if I can do that. Um, but, you know, one thing at a time. I'm in no rush for any of that. <laughs>